Okay. Uh, welcome to my talk on the B programming language. Um, let's just jump into it. Uh, first, a little introduction. So B is a programming language that was written by Ken Thompson. Um, it was inspired by uh, BCPL and Fortran. So Ken Thompson is uh, probably best known as the father of Unix. And he wanted a Fortran, compi uh, Fortran compiler for the, uh, for the PDP-7 that he was uh, writing Unix on. Um, and so he kind of condensed uh, the language and was, uh, and w well, the result was B. And um, it's in fact very similar to BCPL, the, the final thing. So, um, uh, and the name B probably is also like a shorter version of BCPL. Um, in the early 70s, early 1972, uh, thereabouts, um, Dennis Ritchie, the other father of Unix, so to speak, um, uh, took B and uh, kind of gradually morphed it into uh, C, or what is today n uh, known as C. Um, and you can think of B as a sort of simple, very simple version of C wi with only a single type, the machine word, so it's kind of like an integer. Um, arrays of that, but no structs. Um, so it is a very, uh, very minimalistic language. Um, it is interestingly still available on the GCOS operating system, um, but that is quite obscure. So um, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, there are many people who have ever used it or who are using it today still. Um, <coughs> the language was first implemented on the PDP-7, then on the PDP-11, also on uh, a Honeywell machine, a 36-bit machine, and this is also where the GCOS uh, connection uh, is from, most likely. Um, it was resurrected again in 1980, as late as 1980, uh, to drive a, a Mergenthaler phototype setter. Uh, the computer was the Naked Mini, and there's a very nice paper about this project. Um, it's in the, in the links on the last slide. Um, and B is a very nice language because it's, uh, it's portable, uh, and that is because it's, uh, it, the compiler generates interpreted code. It's not compiled directly to machine code, at least uh, the PDP-7 and 11 versions. Um, so it's very, very nice, and it's a very fun language to use, and, and, um, and it's quite easy to implement. Uh, the problem is that the compiler is actually lost. Um, as far as I know, uh, it does, has not survived. At least nobody knows where it could be found. Um, but actually, there are still uh, there were quite a few things, like leftover things, um, that made it possible to like reconstruct the language um, pretty well, actually. Um, and I want to thank Ken Thompson um, and Steve Johnson for uh, like answering some questions and remembering some things about the language. Um, so yeah, uh, some information is uh, f from Ken as well um, that wasn't like available in any sort of documentation or anything like that. Um, so let's start with the PDP-7 version. Um, the PDP-7 is an 18-bit uh, word addressed machine. Here's a photo of uh, the one in Seattle, which I don't know the, uh, the fate of that one now. Um, it has eight kilowatts of memory, and the first version of Unix uh, ran on such a machine and uh, divided the memory in half, one part for the kernel and one part for the user. So the whole B compiler had to fit into four kilowatts of memory, which is quite a size constraint. Um, the first version was implemented in TMG, which is a, sort of a yak-like uh, thing. It's a compiler generator, so you describe the grammar of the language and it, it builds a parser which uh, outputs um, code as, as it parses um, the input. And as I said, the, the output was this interpreted code, and eventually the compiler was rewritten in B itself, uh, which is always nice uh, to have a compiler written in its own language. And of this version, the interpreter library and uh, like the standard library, uh, which is very short, uh, have actually survived. Um, and they were found not too long ago. So I will show you some, some example code. So this is, um, this is the program L case. So um, presumably it turns characters uh, from uppercase to lowercase. Um, that is, that is a, uh, an example of uh, PDP-7B code. And 
you can tell that it looks very similar to C um, because of the character set. Uh, the, what we now know as braces are uh, done with this uh, dollar uh, parenthesis uh, notation. But otherwise, it doesn't look too foreign. Um, it has the uh, auto keyword to declare or to define um, local variables on a s like stack variables. That's why it's called auto. It's automatic on the stack. Uh, they get created when when you call the function and so on. Um, this keyword is perhaps known to some C++ people because it was repurposed in C++ for a different uh, thing for like automatic types, but it actually comes from B. Um, and you have to declare the the stuff that you use that is not inside the function is extern. Um, yeah, there is another program. This is kind of an automatic indentation thing, and here we can see some interesting, uh, also just a cosmetic thing for an for a bitwise or. Um, it uses this caret character, but otherwise it, it doesn't look too um, too hard to understand. Even if the code maybe is not the most beautiful in this case. Um, okay. So this is uh, some, and this would be the the code to of the uh, of the interpreter. So it kind of reads reads a reads a B uh, instruction and splits the address from the opcode part, and then uh, does uh, like a dispatch on the opcode, and then handles all this stuff. I don't want to go into the details of how this is implemented so much. Um, just wanted to show you that this is what has survived from this PDP-7 uh, incarnation of B. Um, so when the Unix uh, group got a, a new machine that was a PDP-11, and it's a 16-bit machine, but uh, very importantly for this language evolution topic, it's a byte address machine. So the PDP-7 is a word address machine. So you have like word at address 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Uh, with the PDP-11, you have two bytes as one word, so you have to increment by two if you want to address words. Um, zero, two, four, six, and so on. So that was quite a difference for, uh, for the language, actually. And this is also the reason why eventually it turned into C. Um, but let's stick with, the, uh, with B for now. Um, so this very first... Uh, like incarnation of Unix on the PDP-11, uh, that machine only had about four uh, had uh, four kilowatts of memory for the user as well. So same as the PDP-7. Later they got more memory. Like the address space was not constrained as on the PDP-7, uh, but still initially it was also quite uh, uh, well. It was not a lot of memory. So four kilowatts is eight kilobytes, uh, of course, on the PDP-11. And this uh, increase in memory um, r made it possible to switch to a different way of implementing B. Um, instead of interpreting these B instructions, um, it was uh, the new scheme was a threaded code, which perhaps some of you know from Forth, which is like a list of function calls almost. Um, so you just uh, have the addresses of what you execute instead of like looking at the bit pattern and figuring out, oh, this is like an addition. It just, uh, it's like a dispatch and uh, just a pointer to the uh, add uh, code and then the whatever code and so on. And, we, and this is kind of the, uh, the stage of the language or the version of the language um, that I focused on um, because it's a bit more capable and there was qu actually quite a lot of stuff uh, around for it. Um, so um, the interpreter, the standard library, and even some binaries survived. The binaries are actually the interesting thing, because from the binaries, you can tell what the compiler did. Uh, so if, if you have some source code, um, and I had some source code for the printf function, for instance, um, and when you have the binary version of that same function, you can, you can check what, what did the compiler do? How did it generate this, uh, this B threaded code from the B source code? Um, and that was kind of the starting point for my project as well, because uh, these binaries had survived, some of them anyways. Um, so at this uh, point, um, B, uh, the B compilation happens in two stages. So the B compiler, it's called BC, 
uh, turns B source code into an intermediate code, which is quite similar to that code which we know from the PDP 7 version of it. Um, though probably not identical, it, it's not quite clear what exactly this uh, intermediate code looked like. Um, and then the second phase, the B assembler, turns this into something which you can give to the actual assembler, the PDP 11 Unix assembler. Um, and the interesting thing is that there are different versions. So for instance, you could have one version to generate threaded code, one version to generate the in interpreted code, or one version to uh, generate a virtual B code, which was also uh, done by Ken, um, because the compiler barely fit into 4K, and when he added a new feature, um, the size of the compiler would grow, and it couldn't run in memory anymore. So he needed a version of B that could run from disk and have more memory to work with, so to speak. Mm. So that hasn't survived. I just know it from what, uh, what Ken said, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how it worked. Um, unfortunately, yeah, well, the thing is I didn't need that because I have a quite a capable machine, so uh, b building a B compiler with all sorts of features is no problem for me. But, of course, back in the day, when you only have 4K, then um, you have to figure out ways to make it work. Um, so for the language, uh, we already saw some uh, cosmetic changes. Um, this is just for the character set. Um, like if you have lowercase ASCII, you can yeah, have a bit more, uh, a few more characters to work with. Uh, the early PDP 7 version has no switch statement, no uh, increment and decrement operators, and no assignment, uh, like add or assignment, subtract or whatever operators. Uh, the PDP 11 version that that we have has them. So uh, B evolved as well um, over some time. Uh, later versions, or, or different versions, actually, the, uh, the, the Honeywell version has a, a break statement to break out of loops or switch statements. It has a default label for switch statements. It has a, a bitwise XOR and a bitwise uh, complement operator as well. Um, and some of the semantics. Um, that we saw that, that 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 are implemented in the in the PDP seven runtime were actually kind of moved into the B assembler, so it generates slightly different code from the PDP seven uh, version that we know. Uh, okay. Oh, actually, I forgot to uh, show some. Well, actually, uh, let, let's do this uh, after the slide. Um, so this is kind of the whole. Uh, the whole inst B instruction set, if you will. Uh, so we have something to uh, push automatic variables and constants and external variables onto the stack. So it's a stack-based language. Many, many interpreted languages are. Um, and these are A, C, and X, and they have different versions. So uh, for instance, uh, if, if it's a variable, you can push the address or the value and this is something the, the old PDP 7 runtime does at runtime, but uh, the PDP 11 version actually handles this in the B assembler phase. Uh, so it has these different versions for, uh, for addresses and not, not addresses, and for ad like popping from the stack and then pushing again instead of only pushing. Um, we have binary operators, uh, we have unary operators, um, all sorts of stuff that you would think uh, you need for implementing a language. So it's quite a simple uh, thing, really. Um, and some examples. How does this work? So we have uh, B code on the left and the, the generated uh, threaded code on the right. Uh, so for instance, expressions, if I want to add one to foo and then divide the whole thing by uh, one, one to foo and then divide the whole thing by two and assign that to bar. I would push the address of an automatic variable. So the four is a stack offset here. So that would be foo. Uh, no, that would be bar, sorry. Uh, right, because we want to assign to bar. Uh, so VA4 would, be the, would push the address of the automatic variable bar then x uh, foo will push the value 
of the external variable foo, c1 will push the constant 1, b14 is add, so it adds one, the top two uh, items on the stack and pushes the result on the stack. Then we push 2 on the stack, b20 is a division, so we divide by 2, and b1 is finally the assignment, so we assign the whole thing to the bar variable. So this is how, you, how the compiler generates these, uh, this code for the expressions. Um, functions co function calls are uh, quite interesting, actually, in some ways. So first we push the, the value of the function. Then with n2, we mark our spot on the stack where the arguments uh, follow. And then we push the arguments one by one uh, onto the stack. And with n3, we jump back to where we pushed the arguments and call the function uh, at that, uh, that we pushed onto the stack. Um, if statements, so there's some control flow stuff. We, first we compile the, the condition. Then if it's false, so that's the f uh, command or f, f instruction, whatever, uh, we jump to the else branch. Otherwise, we do whatever statement one does. At the end of statement one, we jump over the else branch to label two. So t is the transfer or jump uh, operation. Uh, and the else branch is, is statement two. And while loops are similar. So we check the condition, like we compile the condition. If it's false, we jump to the end. Otherwise, we do the statement and jump back to before, uh, like, to the condition. Um, and how are these implemented? So I have some, let's make this bigger. Um, so this is PDP 11 uh, assembly. So this would be the assignment uh, op operator and the or operator, for instance. Um, so it like, pushes things around on the stack and writes stuff into memory. And what we always have is this thing, jump star r3 plus, which jumps to the next address in the, uh, in the instruction stream. Mm, so it's like a fetch uh, thing. So it's quite simple. Um, now to actually run it, um, I have here a, a program which uh, calculates E, the number E. It's from a, from a B manual. This code, I, I just typed it in. Um, so we can, there is a command. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, this is a very confusing thing here. It's a user space Unix version one emulator that I'm running on my laptop. Um, and it's executing the Unix shell. So I can play with Unix version one, even though it's not really running the Unix version one kernel. So it's a bit strange, this thing, but um, yeah. So there is a command called user brc. It's described in the manual, um, which does the whole compilation thing. So it's called it executes bc, ba, uh, assembles the result, links it, and then we have an executable file. So if we run this on our code e, now it's really fast, of course, on my computer. <laughs> uh, so these two phases are from the b compiler. And then these three phases, no, uh, these two phases are from the assembler, and this is the last thing from this, the linking stage. Okay, so let's execute it. And it's probably way faster than on a real PDP-11. But if you know the number E, then you may recognize 7, 1, 8, 2, 8, and so on. Uh, so generates lots of dec decimal digits. Um, and we can check out what the code looks like that it generates. Um, yeah, let's, okay. Uh, I forget. Where is it? User B or C. So let's call this EI. Okay, so this is what the B code looks like. Um, so it pushes local variables, branches around, assignments, whatever. The sort of stuff that you've seen uh, on the last slide. Here it calls some output routines. Um, 
I can also run it on a on a real Unix uh, version one kernel, uh, so just to prove that it act that it actually works. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, that was like the state of B on the PDP eleven, um, but of course it was uh, not really. Well, it was sort of abandoned after a while. Um, and why is that? Well, first of all, there was a port, which I also already mentioned, to the Honeywell uh, 60,000 series. And that actually generated machine code instead of this interpreted code. Um, and it's not quite clear if this version is perhaps already called new B or not. Um, um, but the point is that a byte addressed machine like the PDP-11 is not ideal, it's not an ideal target for B, which only knows about words. Um, so what was needed was a language which actually has support for bytes. And Dennis Ritchie, uh, who also did the, the Honeywell um, uh, port, um, modified B to add these types uh, for characters and integers and pointers to those. And the result was called new B. Um, Okay, now it gets a little bit confusing. Um, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson both say that new B was a compiled language, compiled to machine code. The thing is, just last year, I found some binaries and source code um, for a language which has byte semantics, by different byte and word semantics, but it's threaded code. It's not. It's it's sort of like the the B threaded code, but different with support for bytes. So uh, my take is that this is new B code, um, and I was quite surprised to find it that anything like this was even around. So just last year, uh, I made this discovery. Um, but whatever it is, there was some phase of the language where there was a byte-oriented threaded code to implement semantics which both supported bytes and words. Um, so my take is that the, when the language was renamed to C, uh, that was kind of, uh, or the reason for renaming it was that it actually generated machine code. Um, we have a ver very early version of the C compiler, um, which essentially is... Like, semantically, it looks like new B. Um, I'm not aware of any interesting differences, but it does compile to machine code, PDP-11 machine code. So it's not quite clear to me where this division exactly is and how these compilers um, were developed and how they're, like, different branches of this code, how, how that worked. Um, this is just my findings and my take on it. Um, uh, one important change in C was the the a new way like a new semantics for how arrays work so in c an array name decays it's called decays uh to a pointer to the first element um but you can't assign anything to the name in b you can assign something to an array so an array with 100 elements and you just say a equals blah 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 and then it just assigns a new address to the pointer, uh, to the first element. So it was a real pointer. You had the pointer and the array. In C, you just have the array. Um, and that was a very important change in the language. Um, and it was necessary to make structs possible, because uh, B has no structs, and early C doesn't have structs either. Um, but yeah, that was, that was uh, quite an interesting change, perhaps. And that was also the uh, what made it possible or uh, easy, feasible, whatever, uh, to implement Unix in this new language called C. Um, there were attempts to do it before C had structs, um, but they failed. Uh, but once C had these structs, it was possible to, uh, to write an operating system kernel in it. Um, C, of course, also got floats and all sorts of other more sophisticated typing. Uh, and other improvements in control flow, like for loops, continuous statements, um, yeah. So none of that is in B. Um, so what is my reconstruction? My, my goal was I wanted to write a compiler um, that generated code that matches the binaries that I found exactly. Um, actually, I succeeded. 
Uh, the exact division of the uh, compiler and assembler phase, as I said, is not quite, was not quite clear to me, and the nature of this immediate code. Um, so I made something up that, uh, that works. Um, but it's not original, obviously. Um, but probably not too far off, I would guess. Um, this very, very early C compiler, which I mentioned, uh, you can find it under the name last 1120C because it was the last version of the uh, C compiler for the PDP 1120. Uh, that was extremely helpful because it's uh, still quite close to, to the original B compiler in many uh, respects, and like for the structure of the whole compiler, it, um, yeah, it was just very good to have it. Um, so I have a few few different targets. I have I can generate code for, or I have a runtime library for AMD 64 MIPS uh, 32 bit, RISC 5 uh, 64 bits, and actually the interpreted and threaded uh, version. Uh, versions of uh, for a PDP 11. I, I came up with this interpreted code myself as well. It's not the original one um, because I wanted to fit it into eight kilobytes on a PDP 11 as well. Uh, I succeeded in that too. Uh, so the the interpreted code is shorter, so um, you can you can actually fit it into eight kilobytes, and it works. It, it can compile itself and all that. Um, but the bootstrapping uh, of a compiler is actually a very fun and interesting uh, exercise. So <clears throat> how did I do this? First I wrote a B compiler in C. Then I wrote a new B compiler, but in B. Then I compiled my B B compiler with the C B compiler. And then I compiled the B B compiler with itself. And that kind of closes the loop. And um, then you have a language bootstrapped. Uh, and as I said, it can recreate the original binaries that I found exactly. Um, so um, I'm, yeah, actually I'm, uh, maybe we'll have some uh, time for questions uh, because I'm actually not taking as much time as I thought. Uh, my conclusion is B is a very uh, nice and simple language. Um, it's perfect for learning about compilers. My B compiler is, um, actually it's, let's check it out, it's, uh, it's like, 800 or 900 lines of B code. It's really short, like anyone can understand it. Um, the B assembler is again like two or 300 lines maybe, but still it's like the whole B thing is below 1,500 lines. Um, it, it's not a complicated language. Um, you can learn about parsing and about very simple kind of code generation. Uh, it's just very fun to play with. Um, and it's quite easy to port as well. The interpreted code or the threaded code is quite portable. Uh, you can like stretch it to any word length that you like. Uh, the, okay, 64-bit version uh, may not be as memory efficient as compiling to machine code if every instruction is like a, a full pointer or two even. Um, but it's still fun. Um, and because this is a vintage computing festival, uh, maybe consider using B for your retro projects. Maybe uh, port it to some 8-bit uh, machine, just Im in, uh, implement the interpreter library, the threaded code. Um, it's, it's a surprisingly nice language to use, so it's, it's not like um, some languages are maybe a bit hard to use, like fourth or I don't know. They they can be tiny, but also a bit awkward. B is very like comfortable. Everyone can write B like immediately if, if you know C or anything like that already. Um, so m maybe a good target for uh, for retro projects. Um, okay, and some links to to the things that I mentioned. This is my project uh, where you can find the compiler and everything. Uh, I found this G-Codes manual on the uh, internet as well. Um, Dennis Ritchie has written a very nice uh, history on C, which I also referenced, like the part about Newbie, um, and PDP 7 Unix, and something like version 1 Unix um, uh, have been reconstructed and are uh, running on emulation, and you can find them on GitHub. Um, yeah, I think that is, that's it, but if you have any questions, please ask. Or if you want me to demonstrate anything, um, maybe I should, write, uh, I should probably show you the compiler. Um, 
So I'm oops, it's open already. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of cheating uh, because B doesn't have a, a preprocessor, but I wanted to use like um, symbolic constants. Um, so I'm just using an SED script to replace uh, <laughs> to replace them uh, some things in the B code. But uh, the compiler, yeah, okay. So it's uh, like 900 lines. Um, You can scroll through, and a lot of it is, is tables. Actually, that's that's not the the latest version. I think I have a different version. Uh, unfortunately, my code is a complete mess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I had a shorter version somewhere, um, and the B assembler is also very short. Yeah, three hundred, four hundred lines. Um, but yeah, this gives you an, an impression maybe of what B code looks like. Um, not being able to use structs is a bit awkward perhaps, um, but you get used to it. Okay, yeah, but that's it. Any questions or comments? Yes. New B, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, where do you find something new from last year, from 40 years ago? Well, it turned out that the, uh, it turned out that um, people hadn't really analyzed the binaries fully that were found on some old tapes, like deck tapes. There were some fragments of Unix system, uh, some binaries from this year, some binaries from that year, maybe some assembly source, but many, was, uh, many files were just binaries. And if you assume that it's like maybe compiled C code or assembly code without symbols, you're probably discouraged to even, like you don't want to even look. Um, but I still looked, and like even just looking at the octal dump of the files, it did not look like PDP-11 machine code. I, I, can, I can spot PDP-11 machine code pretty easily, but that looked different. It was just only addresses. Um, and so I, I thought, OK, this, this has to be something else. This is, this is B, uh, probably B. And so I spent, I don't know, a week or two to just disassembling the binaries, decompiling them. I reconstructed the B source code of all of them. Um, actually, there is an interesting uh, point to that. No, uh, little little fun thing. Um, the source for the SU binary, uh, SU command, so to uh, become root user, um, it did not have any uh, password file or anything. It just had the password uh, hard-coded in the source code, and you had to give it as an argument to the, to the command. It not, not type it in like as a prompt or something, just an argument to the, um, to the command. And of course, if, if it's printed on paper, you don't want to you know, have your password for root visible. So what they did was uh, actually use control characters so it wouldn't print. So one of the very early uh, root passwords on Unix was like control Q R S T. Um, I found another version of this, uh, of this code which had a different password, uh, which was uh, control S Y S, so for system. Uh, so it's quite interesting that these things showed up. Um, and this, the shape of the source code, like this exact form, was reconstructed by me. Um, but my compiler can uh, recreate the original binary from that. So I know there is no mistake in it. Just uh, cosmetic uh, changes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that answers the question. Yeah. OK. Right. I actually found the, the B command that I showed, which calls the B compiler and assembler and so on. I found that in unused blocks on a deck tape image. So it was like, uh, uh, the, right, the, the directory was wiped, uh, reused for something else. But in unused blocks, I still was able to find this, this stuff. Um, 
And also some, I think the new B binaries are from that as well. Um, yeah. So that was some serious uh, archaeology. <laughs> Um, I don't know, maybe port it to different machines. I still want to do like a PDP-10 port maybe, or a PDP-1. Um, I considered also writing a compiler to use this new B uh, threaded code or whatever it is. Uh, I don't know if I'm uh, excited enough about that, but um, probably port B to different architectures would be fun. Actually, maybe to a IBM 360. Um, there is someone who expressed interest in that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So if there are no more questions, then that's it. Thanks. <laughs>